Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have Tourism and Marketing Commissioner Heather Pelham and Emergency Management Director Eric Forend here to talk about next week's eclipse and how we prepared for it. But first, as you know, every year we send out our Dear Jane letter to the Senate, giving our review of the House passed budget and where we recommend the Senate make changes. We'll be sending that either today or tomorrow, but as always, we'll be able to share that with you and happy to do so. But today I want to highlight one component that will be in it, and that's our very different approaches to housing investments. As you may remember, my budget included strategic investments in cost-saving and cost-effective programs like VHIP, where we've proven we can renovate existing offline units and bring them back online for a fraction of the cost of other housing programs. In fact, since we launched the program, it's put 547 units back into use, with 400 more under construction and in the pipeline for an average cost of about 38,000 per unit. Compare that with new units costing anywhere from 450,000 to over 600,000 per unit to build. And you can see how important this program is, especially when you factor in the number of years it takes to build new. Unfortunately, the House's slash funding for this incredibly successful program from six million to just one million. It also eliminated our $2 million uh, base increase for the downtown and village center tax credits, which help support housing projects across the state. Not only that, but they cut the Healthy Homes and the Mobile Home Improvement Program by 50%. What the House is doing is unusual. By removing a lot of spending out of the budget itself and putting it into separate tax and spend bills is misleading from my perspective. H829, for example, and this is the tax and spend bill, is being talked about in the House as a long-term housing plan. But again, it's really just a big tax bill because it generates revenue for the general fund, not a special fund that can be used for any purpose in the future. And the programs they've highlighted don't really build much housing, which in a housing crisis should be our primary focus. Again, we have a supply problem. We need to increase it. So any spending we do needs to have unit generation in mind. And the only way we'll get the biggest bang for the buck is if we actually move forward with meaningful regulatory reform to make it easier, less expensive, and faster to build housing. Doing so will make public investments go further, but more importantly, help the private sector, who actually build and fund the vast majority of housing development, do more at a more affordable cost for home buyers. Next, as you all know, we have an exciting week ahead with the solar eclipse on Monday and good weather in the forecast as of now. We're expecting more than 100,000 people to visit the state for this event, and we've been preparing for months. Vermonters should expect a lot of traffic this weekend through Monday and possibly Tuesday. So please plan accordingly and use common sense. Think of this as peak foliage weekend on steroids. I know for some it will be frustrating with a large influx of people, but I want to remind folks, many of our businesses have struggled this year between the floods and the snow situation. So the increased activity could be huge for them. So let's make the most of this exciting event. Be kind, be safe, and hope we see an economic boost out of this historic moment. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pellin. Thank you, Governor. As the Governor mentioned, this total solar eclipse is a once in a lifetime event. Uh, Vermont is lucky enough to be in the path of totality for a celestial phenomenon that truly will be a sight to behold. The Department of Tourism and Marketing, along with other state agencies as mentioned, has been planning for this event for months. 
as have many of our local communities who've been coming together to plan educational programs, festivals, and events of all shapes and sizes. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all of those local volunteers planning those events, not just on Monday afternoon, but throughout this coming weekend. While a total solar eclipse doesn't happen very often, to say the least, uh, Vermont communities do know how to come together to celebrate. And I hope that all Vermonters will make a plan ahead of time to do just that, to spend some time with family and friends to make the most of this historic event. For folks looking for ideas, vermontvacation.com has a full list of events happening throughout the state, as well as additional FAQs. This incredible event for Vermont is also going to bring lots of visitors to our area, many who have been planning for this event for months, and in some cases, even years. And while a large influx of visitors will inevitably bring some traffic delays and perhaps some other inconveniences, this is a great opportunity at a time of year when we traditionally do not see many visitors to have our downtowns, our restaurants, our shops, and our inns full of people. Given the challenges we have faced post-pandemic, as well as after the devastating flooding this year, I hope that all will embrace this opportunity for our local communities to get a real economic boost. The state treasurer has estimated the economic to the boost to the state may be as high as $50 million. And if you are a store owner or a restaurant that might normally be closed on Sunday or Monday, it's not too late to try and stay open and take advantage of this opportunity. Tourism is an incredibly important industry for Vermont's economy, one that provides jobs to over 30,000 Vermonters. And so I hope that all of us will welcome these visitors with patience and kindness. We are encouraging visitors to come early and stay longer, not just to ease traffic congestion, but as there's truly so much for visitors to experience in all corners of the state while they are here. And whether they are here in Vermont for the first time or they choose to experience the eclipse in Vermont because they love all our state has to offer just as much as we do, I hope we can all do our part to make sure that experience is one they will treasure and so they will come back in the future. In addition to sharing information on where to go and what to do, we have also been spreading the word to stay on our major roads, to stay off closed trails, to otherwise respect private property, and to adhere to public safety guidance. For more of those details, I'd like to now turn to Director Forand. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I want to talk briefly about the planning the state has conducted over the last several months to prepare for the influx of visitors that we will see this weekend and for the eclipse on Monday. At the end of last year, VEM formally formed several working groups made up of state partners to begin considering potential issues and resource needs that could arise from a sharp increase in visitors to the state. Working groups focused on communication, safety and security, traffic, public messaging, and other topics met regularly to assess needs, prepare messaging, address rumors, and develop visitor estimates. We also worked alongside the Vermont League of Cities and Towns as they hosted a bi-weekly meeting with municipalities to help them prepare, discuss their events, and gauge resource needs. Vermont Emergency Management partially activated the State Emergency Operations Center on March 25th to finalize planning and will move to a full activation on the 8th for response needs. The Agency of Transportation League partially activated its Traffic Incident Command Center and will fully staff it beginning on the 6th. To assist with potential traffic delays, the state has extended welcome center hours and added portable restrooms at welcome centers and parking areas along the interstate. We will have state police, Department of Motor Vehicles, and Agency of Transportation patrols out to assist motorists. The Vermont Towing Association was contacted to encourage them to ensure tow companies are available and ready on Monday. And the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association was contacted to encourage service stations to plan gasoline deliveries ahead of the event. The state has been working with cell phone providers since last year to ensure service will work for those who normally use cell phones to call emergency services. Service providers have told the state that they are prepared for the influx of visitors and service will be operable in areas that currently have cell service. The state also has five compact rapid deployable units that can be positioned on eclipse day should an area have trouble. Due to the potential for visitors to watch the eclipse in their boats on Lake Champlain, State Police and the U.S. Coast Guard will have a combined five boats in the water conducting patrols. Fish and Wildlife and the Urban Search and Rescue Team both have trailered boats that can be quickly deployed if needed. And I want to point out that Vermont's lakes, rivers, and streams are extremely cold and boating is not recommended at this time. The Vermont Hazardous Materials Response Team will be staged in various locations to facilitate their quick response should it be needed. 
Extra people means more calls for alert local emergency services. That influx and potential traffic could impact emergency response times. Please remember to leave breakdown lanes and shoulders free for these services to use in the event of an emergency. In closing, enjoy this once in a lifetime event, but be prepared. Traffic will be slow, so be patient. Have a full tank of gas and water and snacks in the car, download your directions or buy an old fashioned map and respect road closures. It's mud season and a number of roads are closed for a reason. With that, I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll open up to questions at this point. How much is this eclipse prep costing the state? Well, a lot of the preparations that we are doing are in our normal um, business day, so to speak. We're using uh, many of the entities uh, throughout the state, the uh, secretaries and appointees uh, within the uh, departments and, and uh, commissioners um, as well. But um, so I, I don't know if there's any additional costs, uh, but Eric might have that as well. Uh, there may be a few additional costs. For example, we've increased uh, poor, um, restrooms at the rest areas. Uh, but in general, the State Emergency Operations Center is run by state partners, and we've been doing that during state office hours. So we've been keeping it uh, on normal time. Thank you. I was talking to somebody who saw the eclipse in Oregon. They said they traveled 15 miles in seven hours. What is, what's the state doing to get this message to other states, to Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut? We've been messaging for two months now, and we are reaching out and have reached out to the emergency management uh, divisions in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, and they are pushing our messaging about being patient and the idea that we spoke to Wyoming and they had the same issue in 2017. Uh, so we're just uh, pushing out the message for expectations. There will be some traffic. Uh, just please be patient. Uh, be prepared. Have a plan. Understand where you're going to go. Understand how you're going to get back, and understand that it might take a little bit longer than normal. What are you really expecting? I mean, uh, I know you're telling people to be prepared for everything, but in, in your preparation, are we looking at the interstate becoming a parking lot? What, what, what's your expectation of how this day is going to unfold? There's an expectation. We're using modeling that has about 160,000 visitors coming. Uh, so there is the potential, given that we have only two interstates and a limited number of exits and on-ramps, uh, for potential backups. But, we don't know the extent of what that might be, uh, so we've been reaching out to municipalities and then working with them to ensure that they understand that there may be some uh, ramifications to their local streets as people try to find other ways, uh, so try to be ready for that, understanding that uh, Google and Waze will try to redirect people. Uh, but we have been pushing the messaging uh, to local um, emergency agencies around New England that stay on the roads, stay off dirt roads, the typical springtime messaging. And are you expecting the situation to be worse after the event because people might be coming up Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but most of them are probably leaving after 3.30 on Monday? Right. The partial eclipse ends at 4.36, I believe, on Monday, and that's when we expect traffic to tick up. So we are also pushing the message uh, for stay another day. Enjoy the state of Vermont for an extra 24 hours. You'll miss the traffic, and you get to partake in the great things that the, the state has to offer. Are you at all concerned that the state simply doesn't have the capacity to handle the visitors and the traffic and everything during the eclipse? I'm not concerned. I mean, our infrastructure uh, is there. It'll be taxed, uh, but I know that Vermonters will be patient, and we understand that uh, a large number of people coming to this is actually an opportunity, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So who are these eclipse followers? Uh, have you, like, <laughs> profiled the age, income, where they come from, any sort of interesting characteristics, any language barriers? Uh, I would say that it, folks who are enthusiastic about the eclipse come in all shapes and sizes. There are folks who will travel around um, and have made plans to see this event years ago um, when the first reports came out that Vermont would be in the path of totality. Uh, but we really see this as an opportunity for folks to enjoy an incredible experience in Vermont, whoever they may be. Um, and in terms of our messaging out to folks who might come, you know, in our drive market and beyond is all the safety messages that have been promoted already in terms of, you know, to stay on the major roads, to be prepared for traffic delays, um, but really to, to take advantage of this is an amazing time to see Vermont at a time of year when folks might not otherwise be here. 
Um, so we're really looking forward to making sure that we're putting our best foot forward so folks you know, will come back. It's uh, just a great opportunity and we are getting the message out that folks need to be prepared. And you may not know this, Commissioner, but have you been in contact with, say, hotels, for example, and have any idea of what vacancy rates, how many are taking up across the state for this weekend into Monday, maybe even Tuesday? Within the path of totality, an empty hotel room is going to be very hard to find, I can tell you that. But there is vacancy in other parts of the state. Um, so if you know people do decide to change their plans on Monday morning because the weather is looking good and decide to come up and then we hope they will stay an extra day, there is vacancy. Um, and again, folks are just going to need to be a little flexible um, and plan ahead that there, there will be traffic delays, but it should be a great experience for everyone. I'm actually hoping they'll stay an extra week, maybe a <laughs> month, and, um, maybe a year. So um, you have, ex this is not about the eclipse, um, expressed disfavor with the 3% uh, tax increase for over income of $500,000, but now it's been linked to VHIP, actually, to supporting VHIP, which is also something that you support. Do you feel any more warmly toward that wealth tax than you did before? Well, we funded BHIP in our budget without the tax, so I'm back to, I don't think we need any more taxes and fees. Um, we've, we've outdone ourselves over the last couple of years. They, they initiated a number of taxes last year, um, spent more in the budget than they should have, and now, it, you know, it's come to roost. Um, we are in this position because we overspent, and we didn't plan ahead for this. The financial position we find ourselves in, uh, we're restricted. The federal funding has uh, dried up, and uh, and we didn't um, we we did, uh, but I don't think the legislature took that seriously. How devastating this could be! So when you're faced with a 240 million dollar uh, increase in property taxes, I don't think now's the time to increase any other taxes. Governor, you talk a lot about in your housing plan the need to create units. Um, what specifically is being done about affordability, you know, helping bring down rent or housing prices? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a common economic principle, uh, supply and demand. Right now, we have much more demand than we have supply. We need to turn that around. The more we increase supply, uh, the less demand there will be, and the prices are lowered as a result. So uh, with the, all the money uh, that we have been putting in as well from a from a state perspective, from a federal perspective, using uh, some of the once in a lifetime uh, dollars that came from the federal government uh, to invest in, in housing and, and those initiatives, uh, that will help as well. But again, from a long-term perspective, uh, we need to, to make sure that we have some regulatory reform so that there's an incentive for the private uh, uh, investors and developers, small time, uh, to actually invest in housing which we haven't seen for a while. But, but they do the vast majority uh, of the housing development in the state. What's your read on where the Act 250 conversation stands for right now? Past the House, it's in the Senate. Is that? Uh... I don't think it's changed a whole lot from last week, the week before, the week before that, the week before that. It's, we'll see where it all ends up. But the provisions in S311, I think would have the most benefit for Vermont at this point in time. How about the expansion of the judiciary? Was that part of your public safety message? Well, as far as I can see, the, I mean, there are some, it's mostly just adding positions. And I think some of our public safety is to try and get people moving through the courts, um, getting them to show up um, many, many times those uh, offenders, uh, those who have been cited, don't show up for court. But that doesn't mean the court doesn't have to be prepared. So they sit there waiting, you know, the state's attorney, and the judge, and others uh, waiting for uh, the defendant to show up, and, he, and they don't show up. Um, and there's no uh, accountability for that. So it keeps happening. And so we don't have an efficient court system because I believe we don't hold people accountable enough and make sure that they show up in court. That's why we ask for, you know, going back on to some of our, our bail, you know, undoing some of the bail reforms that we put into place, I signed. Um, so I think uh, we need to think about that as well. But I'm not as um, excited uh, about uh, adding 74 positions to the court system. 
Is the uh, pushback against Larry Saunders giving you pause at all? Um, it's, uh, I think it's unfortunate uh, that they, um, many of those who are expressing their concerns uh, don't do their homework, uh, are believing everything they happen to read on social media, and, um, and don't give her a chance. And I think she deserves a chance. She's a very bright, um, bright person. I think she is the right person at the right time uh, to lead us through a very difficult time from an education standpoint, and she has all the attributes to, uh, to help. What are the things that people are reading on social media that aren't true? I mean, the, I think a lot of people are objecting to her charter school experience, and that's in her resume. Yeah, you know, that's really interesting to me, and as you probably know better than I do, I mean, President Obama was pretty, was pretty popular, um, but he was an advocate for charter schools. Um, Howard Dean, who served 11 years as governor here, was an advocate for, for charter schools. I don't really, that's not what we're trying to promote. It never even came up in any of the conversations I've had um, in the interview process with any candidates. Charter schools didn't come up. It's not something we're, we're going to do in the future. Um, and the only time it came up with <clears throat> that particular candidate was almost a forewarning that this was going to be a hot button for many. So she was prepared for that. Um, but I think her charter school experience will help her help us. And, uh, and I think having that vast experience of both charter schools and public schools, seeing what works, what doesn't, uh, I think could be tremendously helpful. But they need to give her a chance. Governors are background in school consolidation and closings. One of the reasons that you chose her? No, no, that wasn't one either. I, I just believe that she has a numerous, numerous attributes uh, that all together uh, make her the best candidate for the position. Shortly before the press conference, you read a letter for S18 came out. I guess you can kind of just take us through that process. And then also, when you look at the votes, neither would sustain, uh, or override the veto. It's a 20 vote difference in the House, 18 to 11, I believe, in the Senate. Do the vote numbers play a role at all in your decision? Well, if you look at my record uh, in terms of vetoing and determining whether there's going to be an override, uh, that's not a number I look at. I think uh, on the pension reform, which I still believe I was right on, I didn't get a single vote. Uh, so uh, that doesn't enter into my principles. Uh, it didn't enter into the, um, the equation here either. I, I struggled uh, with this decision, admittedly. I talked about this a lot. Uh, for those who haven't read the letter, and because we have so many people on, on Facebook Live maybe hearing this and probably will never uh, read the letter, I think I'm going to read the letter. I prepared for this uh, so that I can at least get that out, and then we can have a conversation about other pieces of it. Um, this is what it says. Dear Mr. Bloomer, pursuant to Chapter um, 11, Section 111 of the Vermont Constitution, I'm returning S18, an act relating to banning flavored tobacco products and liquids, without my signature because of my objections described herein. Admittedly, I struggled with this bill, as it seems hypocritical and out of step with other initiatives that have passed into law recently and over time. To be clear, I too feel we have an obligation to protect our children, but it must be balanced in such a way that we honor the rights and freedoms of adults to make decisions about their individual lives. That's why in 2019, I signed a bill raising the age, the legal age, to buy tobacco or e-cigarette products from 18 to 21, and even increase the tax, something unusual for me, by the way, even increase the tax on some of those products um, to deter use. In my mind, these were reasonable steps that struck the right balance. From my perspective, this bill is inconsistent with other laws relating to legalized substance use. In 2020, the legislature uh, legalized the commercial sale of cannabis, including edibles and other flavored project products, which are now widely available, despite the known risk to youth and their developing brains. Yet, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of an initiative to ban such products, even considering their obvious appeal to minors and negative health impacts. 
In addition, we, the state, allow and in fact act actively advertise and profit from the sale of flavored alcohol products. We also promote and highlight our distilleries and breweries with all their unique flavors, which have been incredibly successful, not only financially, but also from a branding and tourism standpoint. But it can't be denied, alcohol abuse has been the root cause of many societal challenges. I've found people lose faith in government when policies have these types of inconsistencies because they contradict common sense. Furthermore, from a purely practical point of view, these products will continue to be widely available just across the river in New Hampshire and through online sales. Regardless of the outcome of this bill, and if it becomes a law, the legislature should direct the Attorney General and the Department of Liquor and Lottery to further crack down on direct online sales to minors. In conclusion, I'm not convinced the in-state prohibition of flavored tobacco, e-liquids, and tobacco substitutes, substitutes only is justified when sales will remain online and when state law plainly encourage sales of other unhealthy adult products to continue. And that's how I ended up with my decision. Did the revenue um, implication uh, for state coffers? You know, I, that, was, that was something that was uh, brought up uh, during some of the testimony and the floor debate and so forth. It didn't enter into my d decision. So with the motel program, um, advocates say that the administration is purposely making it very difficult for people to figure out what's going on so that they leave in order to sort of take a back door to reducing the size of the program. Uh, it does seem like communication is a problem. Well, I disagree. Um, we have been trying to help those who qualify the program, stay in the program. Um, and I think that uh, maybe somebody from uh, Deputy Commissioner Gray is on the line. Maybe she could answer that question more succinctly. Yes, I'm happy to, Governor. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> Vermonters know that they need to renew um, their authorization at least monthly. I mean, this is nothing that is new, and I say at least monthly because this program is really nuanced. Um, it really depends on what the individual circumstances are for that person, if they have income, what the frequency of the income is that comes into their household. Um, so this is something that we are continuing to work through um, with the Vermonters, and I think um, where we could use help is making sure that everybody's getting the same message that the really important thing is that you're contacting economic services so that we can help support you. Um, we also have a fair amount of Vermonters who want to move motels, um, and so that's something that we also um, have to try to work with them on. Um, and so I think that's, you know, we've heard some criticism about the, the numbers. We have heard from Vermonters who need to do that, and there's also income contributions. Um, so right now we have Vermonters who are paying for their own rooms and because the price is lower they have a few more days that they need to pay um, for now. So, so there's been this fierce criticism that uh, you guys aren't communicating and that these people don't know about this and that they don't they have to renew or that they have to um, uh, re-up their um, qualifications to stay in the rooms. And, uh, you guys are working with these with the motel guests so that they know what's going yeah, on. So Yes, so we have put um, letters under their doors. We also mail letters, but we know that that will take some time to get there. Um, but as I said, most Vermonters who have worked with economic services do know when they're given an authorization, they're also told that they need to call back um, you know, when that authorization is up. Um, so this has been communicated to them. How many, me, how, how many people are currently living in hotels and, and how many left this past Monday? So there isn't, um, we're still working through who left because um, 
from our kids don't have to tell us when they no longer need our services. Um, we just learn that as we are going through um, and seeing where we are at with authorizations. It takes a little bit longer because we also have Vermonters who know now that they need to do their income contribution and so they will wait to call us. So I don't really have a good sense of how many people have moved. We have found that we've had Vermonters leasing up. That's also fairly common around the first of the month. Um, and so I think we are around 1,300 households, including those that we know will have income contributions. Governor, there's a bill also that passed the House uh, modernizing the GA program, making it more streamlined, increasing communication. There's a couple task forces, to, including service providers, but also um, homeless Vermonters as well, to reimagine what the next stage of this is going to look like. Have you seen the bill? I have not, no. Governor, to go back to S18, uh, just going off your letter, um, it seemed like the inconsistency was the big issue that sort of led to your veto. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, it's, as I said, it's almost a, a bit of hypocrisy um, and from everything else we do. We, we have promoted um, distilleries, um, beer, um, many different flavors, substances, and so forth. Um, and we have profited from that. And it, it struck me that we were not, and we, and we again, it's the same uh, age, age group. Um, we have uh, discouraged, again, uh, making sure that we aren't selling to minors, uh, both, um, both in person and online and anything else uh, that, uh, that comes of age. Um, so it just seems like we're treating this a little bit differently, and it seemed hypocrit hypocritical to me. Would you view potential legislation differently if it included, say, ban on the sale of flavored cannabis products or something as well? I, th I do. I am very concerned uh, about edibles, uh, cannabis edibles, and the future uh, that could bring. It seems uh, already a little bit out of control, not just here in the state, but across the board. And, uh, and I think we should get a handle on that. And I just wanted to ask, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how, you know, the potential health effects on kids and kids potentially getting addicted. How did that factor into your thinking when you looked at S18? Yeah, you know, I have the same concerns. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a smoker, never smoked, um, have no use really for tobacco. Uh, so this is nothing to do with me and my own personal views. Um, but it really is about trying to find that balance between protecting our youth, uh, but also uh, protecting the freedom uh, that adults should have to make their own choices. So it's, uh, it was, again, I struggled with this decision, um, but at the end of the day, um, it was it's just about the hypocrisy more than anything else. In, I'm sorry, last thing. When you said that um, you know, these sales would still continue online, even with this ban, those would be illegal sales. Is that, that's, that's right. That's that, that's my feeling. Yes, they are illegal sales, but they are happening, and um, I think uh, the attorney general should should work at it and coming up with a plan. We need to as well um, with our uh, uh, Department of Liquor and Lottery, and uh, try and work together to uh, to counter what we're seeing across the board. Because they're, you know, they're, again, we went from 18 to 21 uh, just four, four years ago, five years ago. Um, so they're still getting the products somehow. And we're, and we're right here, right across the border from New Hampshire as well. So Sorry, um, there was an amendment, I think, in the House that would have added an investigator position to the liquor and lottery. Would you maybe in they came back with the drawing board next year. Um, would you support, uh, you know, increased funding for the attorney general's office or for the current lottery to crack down on out-of-state sales? Well, again, I want to find out what the magnitude of the problem is, what we could do to prevent it. Um, probably counsel with our commissioner and uh, the attorney general to see what's needed. I just don't know. You folks on the phone. We'll start with Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Uh, 
Ted, looks like you're... Can you hear us, Ed? We can see you, but... All right, we'll move to Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, one additional question about the uh, eclipse. Uh, in the state of Texas, they're going to be putting signs up on their highway saying no stopping on the highway to view the eclipse, no parking on the shoulder, keep moving. Are we planning to do the uh, some, some sort of similar thing on our highways here in Vermont? I, I'm, I'm confident we have message boards uh, that will be deployed. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, a number of troopers on the road to keep traffic moving. Um, I, my fear is um, because we have so many limited means of getting through the state to major interstates in our our world um, uh, wouldn't um, wouldn't equate to major in other states. But uh, it only takes one one mishap, one accident uh, to actually stop traffic in its in its place. So that's my biggest fear at this point. But Eric, do you have any more from VSP perspective? Uh, that's correct. We have additional patrols out and AOT assigned packages out. Okay, thank you. No other questions. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey Kevin, Kurt Builder, so you probably know all this a lot better than we do, but you know, um, Building housing takes a very long time. It's a you know a long process. Whether it's a 10-year plan or it's VHIP or Act 250 reform, it's going to take a while. Are there? It, it seems like there you have to do two things at once: enact those sorts of things while finding a shorter time solution, which which seems kind of difficult. You know, lower mortgage rates or or. Um, provide uh, loans to people uh, looking for housing, you know, market rate housing. Is there is there anything like that, that that could be employed to get the process moving at a, at a quicker pace? Well, again, from our standpoint, um, we believe the regulatory reform uh, will get the biggest bang for the buck by moving forward with that. We've been advocating that for quite some time, been acting, asking for a common sense changes to Act 250 for since I became governor, and um, we haven't really, you know, done a lot to move forward in that area. Um, maybe not at all. So I, um, I still believe that's our, that's where we should be, what we should be working on today during this point in time. And yes, I mean we should we should look further um, into the future and and make some common sense changes to Act 250. Uh, in terms of some of what I've seen in in the bill in the House, it could be could be helpful in the future, but but that's not what we should be putting all our eggs uh, into that one basket. Uh, we need uh, we need relief right now, today, um, yesterday, last year, the year before that, and um, it, it couldn't happen soon enough. S three eleven is uh, has some provisions in in that bill that would be helpful. If they want to go further, great, uh, but uh, but I would be. I'd be satisfied getting that bill through. That would be be very helpful uh, to what we're trying to accomplish. And I'm just, I'm as just well, again, I, I just want to. There's some other pieces uh, there uh, in S311 that would be helpful as well, and uh, that's those tax incentives. Uh, having tax incentives would encourage uh, smaller developers and other developers to to move forward, and having. Uh, that barrier, um, the, the regulatory barrier removed, uh, would help as well because people don't have the funding. Smaller, small-time developers in particular don't have the funding to wait something out for years uh, to move forward uh, with their with their vision. Um, so they don't they don't even start, and uh, those who start uh, suffer as a result. Well, that's the sort of thing I was wondering about. You know, even on the almost something like an earned income tax credit on the housing side, which could be implemented. But I mean, I, I, I understand the politics of all that, but um, that would that would be a very sort of fast bang for the buck in that regard, too. Sure, sure. tax incentives uh, work very well, I believe. So if they want to venture down that road, uh, we would be all ears. Uh, and, but we have some provisions we've, uh, we've pushed forward with. All right, great, thank you, Governor. Sarah Digger. 
Hi, Governor. Um, I've heard from the folks over in the Senate that they have not yet received your, your official letter indicating the nomination of Zoe Saunders um, for the Education Secretary position. Why is that? Well, she's not starting until the 15th of April. They can't begin with their confirmation process until that they receive that letter. So are you saying you're not going to send the letter until April 15th? Well, I wouldn't think that they could start the confirmation process until she gets here and is on board. Don't you think that's a pretty tight timeline if they're getting out of session around May 10th is what I've heard so far, though maybe I should knock on wood on that. Um, that that's less than a month for them to move through the confirmation process. Don't you think that's a little tight? I have great faith in their ability. I, I don't believe the confirmation process typically takes all that long. And some of them have already made their mind up. Do you think it might take a little longer this time around considering the tone of things thus far? Um, we'll see. Okay, thank you, that's all. Back to the room. Governor, were you able to read or see the auditor's report about EB-5? I, I didn't, uh, I, I did a quick <laughs> overview of it. Uh, nothing surprising in there from my standpoint. How so? Um, it was things we already knew. Um, in fact, you know, we wanted everyone to know what we knew. And we advocated for the release of uh, all the documents early on, as you remember, when I first came into office. Um, and uh, the AG's office didn't want to release them. Um, so when they went and um, they made, it, uh, made this deal with the auditor uh, to come up with an independent report, we advocated for that to come out as soon as possible. I'm grateful that it finally came out. Just generally, what's your confidence level in the, the EB-5 program as an economic development tool going forward? I don't believe that it's going to have uh, much of an effect here in Vermont. Uh, we have a, a regional center uh, that we just have those who are in the program in that, uh, under that regional um, direction. So, um, but I, I don't, we're not promoting anything in the future with it. On a much lighter topic, um, we've heard this weekend you said to make your acting debut at Mount Mansfield at Union High School. I was just wondering kind of how that came to be and what that process looked well, like for you. They were very creative in their um, invitation. Uh, they sent numerous, numerous productions uh, asking me to participate. And um, so hard to say no. And they were, uh, again, they, they were well done, uh, very enthusiastic. and and. Again, hard to say no. Not something I'm actually looking forward to, though. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, H612, a cannabis bill that would allow a loophole, uh, critics say, allow a loophole for sales to older teens, was approved in the House. It's now in the Senate. Asked you a few weeks ago. You said you didn't, hadn't thought much about it. Any thoughts now? Still haven't thought much about it. I don't know where it's going in the in the Senate, whether they're moving forward with it or not. Governor, back to the eclipse. Um, do you have any UN plans? Are you going to be joining the traffic rush? Or no, I'm going, going to stay local and not uh, add to the problem and see. Well, I mean, we can look up in the sky. We have a we're on the edge of it here in South Vermont, and we'll, we'll be watching it from here. Let's see, Ed Barber is. Oh, Ed, are you back? Uh, go ahead, if you can hear us. I may regret this, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> go can ahead, Ed. Yeah, I can. All right. There's a storm coming. There's a little problem with the signal here. Uh, Governor, I want to uh, return back to last week's press conference. Uh, you were talking about uh, different ways of making major reforms to uh, education in Vermont and how it's funded. <clears throat> At the time, you said everything is on the table. So my question is, 30 years ago, uh, the former Speaker of the House, Ralph Wright, tried to pass through a statewide teacher's contract to bring equity and pay and control the 
come on, I'm just for the Santa Cruz. And not all of that extent to support that. My question to you are, is that concept uh, as well on the table as a means of reforming uh, cost of education? Yeah, I think it should be on the table. Um, in fact, we advocated for that early in my uh, uh, career as governor. So it's not as though it hasn't been public. That's, that's something we had thought was a good idea and some, some concept uh, of that so that all these local school boards who don't have the means uh, to, to, um, to negotiate with some of the unions and so forth, um, put it in someone else's hands and uh, maybe even regionally or statewide. Um, we're just such a small state, it seems like to me, that one district ratchets up the other and, uh, and utilizes that as a tool. And I just think having it all in one place would make some sense. But, but again, that's not, uh, there are many other reforms that need to be made, but that, that is on the table as well. Or I, say, and I should say it should be on the table. It, it isn't on the table that I know of. Um, this is just from my perspective. And so in, in, in a context that's somewhat similar to the uh, move a few years ago of enacting a uh, statewide health care or, or health insurance program, for all, uh, for all teachers of Vermont, would, would that be considered a similar parallel? Yes, yeah. Now, they, they did do something with that, but it wasn't anywhere near what we had proposed um, and proved to be ineffective from my standpoint. Very good, thank you, and uh, stay out of the storm. Yeah. <laughs> Governor, the Senate just passed S310, which is, among other things, mapping uh, a flood re mediation map, a state flood mediation map. Uh, the Republicans voting against that said, FEMA's already doing that. This is just duplication. And Senator Bruce says, um, actually, it'd be nice to have our own map. Any thoughts on that bill and that process? Yeah, I, I think we should avoid any duplication um, in terms of any dollars that are spent. So we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that as well. Um, but I think things are going to get a little tighter, uh, not, uh, not more lucrative in the future uh, in this state. So we should be looking for ways to save money. Thank you, Thank you all very much.